Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us today. This is a celebration of the launch of the publication entitled The Power of Place, A Sustainable Future with Geospatial Insights. This is a joint venture between the Knowledge Transfer Network and Ordnance Survey. And we've had over 400 people register, so it's wonderful to have such a great audience. More people will hopefully be joining us. You're probably familiar with Ordnance Survey. It's the National Mapping Agency for Great Britain. And the Knowledge Transfer Network is a network partner for Innovate UK, and it exists to make collaboration easier across different sectors in business, academia, and other innovation support providers. My name is Kim McAllister. I'm going to be moderating this webinar today. Just before we begin, I'm just going to run through a little bit of housekeeping. So you'll see down the side of your screen that you have a chat box and you can use that if you have any technical issues. If you'd like to ask any questions, you'll see there's a Q&A button and you can use that. You can also upvote other questions if you're particularly interested to hear the result and you can mark them too if you want to go back to them. I'll be keeping an eye on that chat box, so we'll make sure that we try to get all the questions asked that you are keen to understand. And similarly, we'll be running polls using Mentimeter. So um, please join in when you see that, and we'll be sharing the results of those after the webinar. If you're a social media fan like me, you can also follow along on Twitter and LinkedIn. Our hashtag today is hashtag the power of place. So I really urge you to use that and to take advantage of that networking opportunity. So I'll now hand over to Andy to tell you about the publication. Thank you, Kim, for that great introduction. Um, so my name's Andy Bennett. I lead on space and geospatial at the KTN. So from the early days of developing this idea for a geospatial insight special interest group to, to today, I couldn't have imagined the opportunities, challenges that have occurred and impacted on the sector and activity of our group. And therefore, I believe it's a really exciting time to be part of the geospatial sector. Whether it's the UK government uh, investing in OneWeb to potentially provide a more precise and more secure equivalent to GPS, or KTM working with Fairshare to identify better and more efficient ways to distribute food to vulnerable people in situations such as COVID-19. To quote my colleague Luca, geospatial is changing our world. And in the next three to five years, companies of any size and from all sectors will be gaining an insight and a critical advantage using geospatial data. It's been a busy month for publications. The Satellite Applications Catapult have released their geospatial innovation in 2020. The UN's Future Geospatial Trends in Geospatial Inf Information Management and the excellent Geospatial Commission strategy setting important policy and direction for the UK. Now the KTN and Ordnance Survey have collaborated on this thought leadership publication, The Power of Place, A Sustainable Future with Geospatial Insights. Clearly geospatial is becoming pervasive, but we wanted to take a look from a different perspective with this publication and to develop a narrative of innovation in the geospatial sector. This publication is divided into three sections. In the first part, we bring forward the changing landscape of location intelligence and its implications for business as usual. We discuss the emergence of a new and powerful data knowledge infrastructure where spatial analysis, artificial intelligence, cloud and edge-based computing turn the geospatial mesh. And we make note of the trends in the geospatial data market and the move towards a platform as a service model. We explore the growth of the sector as well. Indeed, consult consulting where estimate that the wider economic impact of location is calculated at adding 10 to 15 billion per annum to the UK economy. The second part of the, of the publication looks at the innovation challenges in the sector. We examine the importance of building a collaborative economy that unlocks data from silos and uses collective intelligence tools to harness knowledge across sectors. We at the KTM believe collaboration is key to innovation and to enable a sustainable future. Similarly, the, the Centre for Digital Built Britain was launched to enable industry alignment across the built environment. Collaborating on this shared vision will result in shared benefits for society, the economy and the environment. In the publication, the importance of systems thinking and data ethics is also explored, illustrating how to build resilient socio-economic infrastructures fit for a connected and autonomous future. The COVID-19 pandemic, for example, has shown that resilience in many human systems, such as our economic system, is low, and knock-on effects happen quickly, even in the short term. To improve resilience, we need to look at the system as a whole. Using geospatial data is crucial to developing this understanding as it provides a link between the physical assets and the digital world. The UKRI's Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund 
Future Flight Programme is a great example of systems thinking and building collaborative partnerships to explore new technologies, as well as enacting significant behaviour change. In this challenge, vehicles and airspace management systems will be dependent on geospatial data. Finally, we reflect on the role that geospatial intelligence plays in supporting the delivery of positive change, from addressing global challenges to delivering a new framework for responsible investment. Geospatial data will play a significant role in achieving net zero targets, making sure the best energy solutions are placed in the optimal locations, providing location-based information not only for routing choices, but also for deployment, pricing and charging in electric vehicles and better development of multimodal transport options. And in planning, just look to the Geospatial Commission's National Underground Asset Register Programme for efficiency gains in reducing roadworks and congestion, contributing to supporting uh, net zero targets. I hope this publication generates interest and stimulates some discussion. So please do get in touch with Luca or myself over the next few months to discuss any of the topics raised. It's been a real pleasure to work with Orden and Servi on this publication to join forces to bring forward discussion and creative thinking. And we hope builds an opportunity for the geospatial sector in the UK by connecting ideas and people and taking geospatial into the mainstream. To quote David Henderson from Alden Survey, we want to create a ge geospatially enabled nation, one that shares, integrates and uses a wide range of data to achieve social, economic and environmental benefits. And with that, I'll hand over to Nick Hamilton, Senior Content Lead at OS, to talk a bit more about their involvement in the power of place. Well, thanks, Andy, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're really pleased to bring you the Power of Place publication, and thanks to KTN for the opportunity to work with you on it. The structural shift we see taking place in geospatial that are discussed in the pages of the report, we believe at the core of this shift is the demand for geospatial intelligence and insight whether that be for a new innovative service or to manage and plan infrastructure, for, to make policy decisions or quickly decide how to deploy resources. And we saw location at its best during the COVID crisis by providing context and supporting decisions as the NHS government agencies and businesses scrambled to meet the challenge. Underpinning all of this is the increasing demand for certainty in and an assurance in the quality of geospatial data. Our role at Ordnance Survey should be to guide high quality geospatial data capture, but also keep it maintained and updated. We're really pleased to see a vision and the new strategy from the Geospatial Commission recently, which gives us a way forward. And tomorrow at Ordnance Survey, we're launching new and easier access to our valuable and trusted data for everyone which is a key part of the commission strategy being realized. So we look forward to discussing this and a lot more during the Power of Place webinar series, and uh, we welcome your input. Thank you very much for joining us and back to you, Kim. Thank you, Nick. So as our speakers have said, we're here today to discuss the value of geospatial insights to the economy. And we're launching the publication today with four great speakers. So first we have Knowledge Transfer Network's own Luca Bodello, whose goal is to help geospatial startups and SMEs to meet the challenges and realise the opportunities to grow the sector to its full potential. Luca? Thank you, Kim, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I am the Geospatial Insight Lead at the Knowledge Transfer Network, and in my job, I support the geospatial community to engage cross-sector and uh, reach out to those industry verticals where geospatial or location intelligence add value, help to grow the economy and achieve positive impact. This publication is part of this effort, uh, supporting the geospatial community to change the narrative around geospatial technology as the domain of a few tech-savvy geoinformaticians to a fundamental enabler of the connected and autonomous world we are building today. Geospatial data enables autonomous cars to drive down motorways, construction managers to track assets in large-scale civil engineering projects, commodity traders to predict continental scale yields to guide investment, and city officials to tackle pollution and carbon emission via better monitoring. 
My prediction is that within the next five years, companies of any size will make use of geospatial insights to gain a critical advantage against their competition. This company will not build in-house geospatial team. That would be too resource inefficient, too expensive. They will rather use the employ the services of location intelligence platforms, uh, which are starting to emerge. They will work collaboratively, sharing data, sharing knowledge, sharing APIs, building people-focused solutions, achieve efficiency gains, tackle the many challenges we face in society, fuel growth, productivity, and prosperity. But how do we change the current paradigm based on competition to one that favor collaboration or a mix of the two? Well, we need to address data first, data standards, data protocols, but above all, data silos. Currently, data owners are not incentivized to desilo data and make it available because there is an absence of trust that they, that they will be able to share the value being created with it. This is not a technology problem per se. Well, there, are, there are many technical challenges to create data fusion environment, to package data in a way that is clean, standardized, harmonized, linked to non-geo data. But in reality, this is a trust issue trust that needs to be built amongst data owners. Take the National Underground Asset Register Program, or NUAR. This is a prime example of how to use a platform as a service environment to build trust across the many participating stakeholders. NUAR aims to create a secure data exchange platform to provide a digital record of where underground utilities, pipes, and cables are located so to guide maintenance work, new infrastructure, and reduce unnecessary roadworks, for example. In the first few trials in London and uh, uh, the Northeast, NUAR shows that data can be shared by public and private sector organization without compromising privacy or competitiveness, while delivering gains for all parties involved. Trust is only one part of what I discuss in this chapter about the collaborative economy. Other non-technical challenges to innovation being understanding the business model to power a collaborative efficiency models, open source, the sharing economy. The advent of new technologies such as power a trustless architecture, for example, to log where intellectual property is being created across a supply chain and distribute value accordingly. Build people-centric product example, mobility as a service that aims to put the citizen at the center of the system rather than the transport operators. To conclude, uh, the global challenges we face, such as air pollution, climate change, pandemics, require greater collaboration across sectors. No one organization can solve them alone. This is especially true in uh, this very strange time of COVID-19, when sharing information is being prioritized over generating profit from it. Perhaps this pandemic will help us rethink some of the current assumptions and help us rebuild a better normal, obviously with the help of location intelligence. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you, Luca, that was brilliant. And next we have the research scholar, Caroline Zim, who is currently working on the international research initiative, The World in 2050. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this uh, initiative and my colleague Nebojana Kacinovic, who is leading the World in 2050 scientific initiative. We are based at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And as you can hear from the name, we have a very long track record in systems analysis. We're the go-to place for science-based policy advice in, link in looking at interactions across different systems. And I want to show you how in the World in 2050 initiative we are dealing with this. Um, so we look at interactions across multiple um, development goals. Um, in a, we focus, we, we want to introduce different innovations in how we can tackle um, develop, uh, transformations to sustainability challenges. And one way I want to show you is a more people-centered perspective. And I'm great, uh, great Glad that Luca already mentioned this, and also how geospatial data can help us in improving, um, uh, providing demand side solutions that help human well being and to uh, meet human needs and behaviors and lifestyles. 
So when you have uh, multiple goals, you might have all seen these uh, very colorful and nice tiles, the sustainable development goals. And I'm glad that Luca already also elaborated on the interactions between human and earth systems, because these uh, 17 goals and 169 targets and more than 200 indicators to track these goals actually show what the world has agreed on for a visionary future for all of us. But obviously all these different indicators um, bring with them contradictions, um, but some of them also actually enable, it, um, them, uh, enable them. So there are synergies within these goals, but there's also trade-offs. And if you don't plan um, early on for these synergies and trade-offs, you might, you might miss out on the synergies and then you might end up being left with all the trade-offs. Um, and this is what systems thinking is about, that when you enter um, your object, when you, when you start planning, you think about the interactions across the system. So to give you an example, in 2050, we might have 9 billion people on the planet and we want to feed them. But then we want to give them nutritious diets um, and we wanna not, don't want to infringe on water resources. We want to stay within the climate boundary. And at the same time, we also want to keep enough land for biodiversity or natural forests. So if I don't think about these objectives from the beginning, I might end up with different solutions to the problem. Yeah? I, can, I can provide energy to everyone with coal power, but then I, I ignore all the other objectives I have here. And this is what um, systems thinking is about. Um, within the World in 2050 initiative, we have looked at how we can provide pathways to meet all these sustainable development goals. And we have identified different innovations of how to actually harness like maximize the synergies across the goals, but alleviate the trade-offs at the same time. Um, we already published two publications on this and the third one is in its final production stage. It's going to be launched today in a week and you're all welcome to join the webinar, which is going to be similar to this webinar, but we don't have the registration link yet. So please get in touch with me afterwards and then I can share the details with you. And this year we looked at uh, innovations, but in a very broad sense. So not only technological innovations, but also social innovations and institutional innovations that should all be people-centered. Um, and we also tried to uh, account for the COVID pandemic and, uh, and the, she said uh, the pandemic has actually shown that we have to deal with, to link how human well-being can be achieved within planetary boundaries. So I want to, Give you one example of one of these innovations that we think is uh, helpful and where geospatial actually also comes in and this is a people-centered perspectives that will help us to leverage efficiency potentials. You might have seen energy supply um, graphs where usually you have primary energy on the left and then you have a conversion chain and at the end you have useful energy of how people use energy in the end. But in the, the fact is, we should actually turn it around. So what do people actually need? They need thermal comfort at home. They need mobility services. They need communication. They want to cook their meals. They don't care about kilowatt hours or gigawatts installed in power plants. Yeah? And if we turn it around and we start with the people and their needs, there's actually large um, efficiency potentials that we can leverage across the conversion chain. Because if you reduce the demand side, then the leverage effect um, leads to a large saving on the supply side. And this is true for other systems as well. Take, for example, the food system. And this brings then on positive impacts for the other systems that are connected to the energy system, for example, water or, or food or infrastructure. And this is where geospatial then comes in, because with more granular data, both in time and place, we can better match demand and supply. We can improve the services and the service quality actually that people need. So going away from the thinking of supply side only, what kind of infrastructure do I need, but actually what do people need? They need mobility services. And granular data can actually help us to combine different modes, as Luca has already said. It brings together different systems. So we can create a systems of system um, that is helping us to improve uh, human well-being and we learn also with granular uh, with uh, geospatial data we can learn more about actually human behaviors and lifestyles and the changes that are needed to achieve um, a sustainability transformation to, to stay within planetary boundaries. Uh, yeah as a summary think about synergies and trade-offs when you do your work um, we have shown how to do this for the sustainable development uh, goals think about a people-centered approach and uh, use geospatial data to improve service quality and harness efficiency potentials. Thank you very much, Kim.
Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much, Caroline. Next, we have Alex Berdichevskaya. She's the research lead at Nesta's Center for Collective Intelligence Design. So welcome, Alex. So thanks for inviting me to be part of this webinar and the publication generally. I really enjoyed thinking about collective intelligence in the context of geospatial. And actually, even though we didn't practice it, I think um, Kim's presentation really sets up what I'm about to tell you about the kind of methods that can tap into distributed insights from participatory methods. So I work for an organization called Nesta, which is an innovation foundation. And my team specifically looks at the different methods that mobilize distributed human intelligence in order to address social challenges. And we have a range of activities in order to achieve that. So we provide funding to support experiments in order to understand how to best optimize systems that draw on both machine and human intelligence. We conduct research in-house. So our latest program of work there has been around AI and collective intelligence. But we also, importantly, have this connection to practice in the field. So we develop design resources and work with implementation partners like the UNDP Accelerator Lab Network in order to test out these methods in the field and figure out how well they can be applied to solving really complex problems like the Sustainable Development Goals. But what exactly is collective intelligence? Well, it's really simple. It's been around for a long time. Um, it's the idea of people thinking and working together in groups to solve problems. And um, an early example is the crowdsourcing of the first edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. I really like that one, but it took over 70 years. And when we think about the kind of collective intelligence that we might be coming across uh, day to day in our lives, um, obviously the scale has shifted uh, considerably. So uh, I'm sure most of you access Wikipedia, the collaborative knowledge commons that's a continuously evolving uh, source for us all. Or um, some of you may be using the kind of travel navigation apps to get around your cities, which uh, use the location data from individual users in aggregate form, but also uh, solicit active crowdsourcing of real-time updates in order to uh, help people make better travel plans in their cities. And so when we think about 21st century collective intelligence, it's really about more than just connecting people. It's about uh, mobilizing uh, these different aspects of intelligence. So having novel data sources that we're making use of, connecting distributed networks of people, and also uh, having new technologies that are extending human capability in terms of problem solving. So thinking about this in the geospatial context, when we, we are considering novel data data sources, I'm talking about hardware like uh, drones and on the ground sensors and also satellites, obviously, which are helping us to track and monitor the world in, in ways that weren't previously possible. Um, when I think about digital infrastructure, it's as simple as the kind of connectivity that the internet enables. But what's changing now is that it's en enabling new forms of governance like peer-to-peer -peer learning networks and uh, deliberative democracy platforms, which allow decision-making about priorities and how we might manage really complex issues. And then finally, we've got artificial intelligence and data analysis capabilities, which are extending the kind of modeling capabilities and ways that we're able to track and understand causality in really complex dynamic situations that have multiple dependencies. And so when it comes to complex problem solving, we need all of these aspects of 21st century collective intelligence to make progress. Um, I think examples are the best way to kind of bring it all to life. And one of my favorite that I think is quite relevant to this community is called Map with AI, which is a collaboration between industry and the humanitarian sector. Uh, and it's an AI tool that uses computer vision in order to uh, help community mappers. So this is a distributed network, a global network of uh, uh, remote volunteers who undertake 
crowd labeling and crowd mapping on OpenStreetMap in order to address uh, humanitarian challenges such as disaster response or understanding the kind of resource distribution in unmapped communities, unmapped regions, or the kind of changes that happen when there are conflicts and environmental crises that affect those communities. And combining computer vision with satellite data and that distributed skills that the crowd brings is enabling a different, more efficient and accurate way of addressing that problem. And so we see that collective intelligence can be applied to uh, developing this more, this richer, more contextual understanding of an issue, which uh, makes use of complementary capabilities of humans and machines, but it can also be applied at other stages of the innovation kind of cycle. So um, different participatory methods like crowdsourcing and challenge prizes might be used to generate new solutions. And equally, monitoring and decision making uh, can also draw on the power of distributed human intelligence through technology. And we're seeing more and more that uh, these things are being combined into more systemic approaches so that it's not just about addressing uh, an issue at one stage of the innovation cycle, but actually thinking about it more holistically. And I won't have time to talk about this because I'm sure I'm over time already, but I encourage you to look up this example, which is a new type of platform addressing ecosystem change, which looks at addressing collect or implementing collective intelligence to understand problems, to seek solutions, and also to make decisions and incentivize more sustainable agricultural practices to prevent biodiversity loss. Um, but I, I will hand over now. Thanks for uh, paying attention and look forward to the questions. Thank you, Alex. Gosh, so much in that. Um, we could have a whole webinar just on you, I think. Uh, thank you for joining us. Ben, would you like to give your introduction now? Um, hi, yes, sure. Um, hello everyone and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I work with Ordnance Survey on the Benchmark Initiative and what we do is promote ethical use of location data. And I think at, at this point, location has been attached to so many things in recent years and attached to so many other data sets it wasn't previously attached to. It's created enormous economic poss possibilities, enormous powers. But whenever you, you create uh, technology, creates new powers, it, it's, it's necessary to pay some attention to whose interests those powers are exercised in. And so this is why Ordnance Survey got together with Omidyar Network uh, last year and created the Benchmark Initiative. This is us. Uh, as I say, it's uh, Ordnance Survey and Omidyar. Um, Omidyar is, uh, Pierre Omidyar is one of the founders of PayPal and uh, uh, Put, um, created a foundation to support good governance projects worldwide. They got very interested in location data, I think, originally from a, a kind of land rights perspective. And, uh, and uh, Ordnance Survey decided that, you know, it, as the UK is, is placing itself as, as a, you know, really one of the leading countries in geospatial, part of that needs to be uh, a, le uh, a leader in, uh, in good practice and responsible practice. Um, so, this is the program. We have a there's a parallel research focus project pro, uh, program in the USA called Ethical Geo. And so this is what we do. We explore the ethical issues around location data. I suppose there are two sides to this really. There's there's uh, um, getting the geospatial professional and users to to talk about what new ethical issues are, are coming up through having far far more data. And the other side is bringing location into those data ethics debates, which, are, you know, over the last decade, there's, there's been a lot of uh, debates about data ethics. Um, but quite a lot of it has been focused on the Internet, on what goes on online. Um, and then a, a certain amount about, you know, data processing within companies and within within how services are delivered. But very little of it has talked about the relationship between data and the physical, the wider physical world. And so that's, that's really where we, we want to focus. So we, we want, want to increase understanding of the risks, but we're not all about the problems. We also want to encourage um, uh, innovative responses, particularly perhaps applications that, that enable 
extensive use of, of geospatial data while addressing privacy risks is sort of one of the big and um, obvious ones. And we're, we're hoping to generate international uh, discussion. We've already managed a certain amount of that and, and create a, a positive in, impact in the UK, but also that goes beyond the UK. So what, what is it? It's a series of events uh, we, we had uh, back a thousand years ago when we used to get to meet rooms full of people. We ran several uh, physical events at Geovation in Clerkenwell in London. We're now uh, running them online. And we run an entrepreneur program where we fund uh, innovators to, to uh, develop. Um, well, here, is, here are the examples that they're, they're addressing. Uh, a, a game to help people understand location data risks and ethics um, and uh, uh, anonymization in transport data and in development data. And now we're also working on the Lockers Charter, which I'll we'll say a bit of, uh, in the moment. So our, our discussions, we covered uh, what is ethical use of location data, what are the impacts of bias and selection, what it actually means to, to innovate in practice ethically. And then since we've been running things online, we decided, like everyone else, to address the pandemic. And so we've discussed tracking infection, how to manage distancing at work fairly and safely, similarly in public spaces. Last week, we looked at data colonialism, the, the hoovering up of data in developing countries uh, by digital majors. And uh, on fr this Friday, in a couple of days, we're, we'll, we'll look at data and human migration. So what's come out of this work has been that while there is a, a really a, a lot of willingness in, in geospatial users to act responsibly, there aren't really uh, uh, sets of principles and guidance that, that are up to date with, you know, with the really extremely fast changing world of what is possible. So we're now working internationally uh, with partners to explore uh, this on what we're calling the Locus Charter. And it's to develop practical guidance for, for how people in uh, using geospatial data can work out what, what are the risks in their area and how they might ad address them. And it's partly to create a, a kind of a, a shared language um, as well as a load of shared expectations so that um, you, uh, people who are affected can also have something to, to, that they can use to, uh, as, a, as a way of describing uh, their, their concerns. So yeah, we aim to agree an international set of principles and guidance, and we want a world where location data is used for the betterment of the world and all species within it. And we're aimed at, we want to help practitioners, but we also want to reach policy and decision makers responsible for activities that, that use location data. And I'm very glad to see, uh, I hope others will have noticed that in the um, UK's geospatial strategy published very recently, there was an important commitment to work on ethics of location data with the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. So this, this is right full and centre in, in, in kind of common concerns in our sector. That's a little more about the principles and the intentions of the Charter. And we're, we're up and working on it now and we'll be going through um, to the autumn and, and gradually opening to more, more public uh, involvement and wider involvement in it. So details there about how you can get involved in the Charter um, and my colleague Denise's contact details. Um, please, uh, please join in and um, uh, see what you can, you can bring to discussions. Lastly, this Friday, uh, as I said, 2pm, we'll be discussing location data and human migration, um, how location data can be used to protect and support uh, um, people uh, moving and com community, vulnerable communities and people in, in movement, and also how, how to address the potential risks of data about them used, being used against them. And we have a great uh, uh, international panel on for that. So please do, you'll find that link through the Benchmark Initiative website. Please do join us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. And I'm glad we got you in there. I'm sorry for not getting you in when you should have been. Um, we're now going to move on to q &As. And as I said, people have been great about asking questions in the question box. Um, before we go through these, I would just like to ask everyone on the panel if you could turn your microphones on. And I'll ask you in turn what you would like to pull out of this publication that you think 
is a really important point. Luca, we'll begin with you. Uh, sure, thank you very much, Kim. Um, well, um, in putting together this publication, I was uh, uh, very aware of uh, the fact that uh, we need uh, more cross-sector collaborations. Uh, technology communities, uh, like geospatial community, uh, tends to look and communicate inward to the same group. And uh, working at KTN, we, uh, our USP, our unique selling point is really uh, building uh, networks that are cross sector, that engage across many industry verticals. I personally believe that it is at the intersection of knowledge fields where you find new ideas and, uh, and solution to challenges. And uh, this publication goes in this direction. We wanted to engage with the, with the in infrastructure sector, with the transport sector, maritime, finance, aviation, and, uh, and uh, showcase uh, and uh, start a conversation to show how uh, geospatial technology and location intelligence can uh, support uh, and create value uh, in their challenges. Um, and resolve some of their challenges. So I hope uh, decision makers and technologies in those sectors that uh, are here today uh, would like to engage with us, uh, get in touch, and, uh, and uh, connect with the provider of geospatial solutions. Fantastic. Thank you. Caroline? Yeah, thank you. I think it's similar to what Luca said, just from a different perspective. And um, so within the World in 2050 initiative, we tried to bring in to different uh, scientists from different disciplinary backgrounds. And we also had to create a common language. And that took actually quite long. I mean, you can imagine scientists when they start arguing. And I thought that this project uh, was quite interesting for me personally, also because I realized my language also doesn't fit sometimes with when I, when I talk to Luca about how we can present these ideas. And so it's, it's just good to get out of your comfort zone sometimes and, and, and meet with people who do other things. And I have to admit that I, before joining this endeavor, I never thought so much about geospatial data because I work more on a global level where everything gets aggregated and averaged out on national averages or even regional averages per capita CO2 emissions, for example. What, but of course, in, 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 in real life, this, this is not how it's happening. And, and for me, this was, uh, this is also the value in the publication that you have a lot of, you're trying to bring together a lot of loose ends and, and, and tie a nice story around all these to do's that we have out there that we have to, um, yeah, to get done to, to have a better future, basically. Yeah. Thank you, Caroline. Ben, what would you say? So I, I mean, partly I, I think it's great that we're doing this because I think the, as I, as I said earlier, you know, the, the increase in use of location data has been enormous in, in recent years, but it, it's also quite a lot of it has been um, under the radar, if that's not a appalling mixed metaphor in some way. You know, it's it's been incremental, but very fast, as it were, and it, and it sort of got into a lot of things. And I just... I, I certainly don't think policymakers are all over both the positive and negative potential of all of this. I, you know, the, so I think it's really important that we, we publish things like this that actually go go around a whole load of the major issues and allow us to to step back a bit because you know we're in a in a situation where just keeping up with what you can use could take all of your time. You know, and then and that misses. The whole other thing that you get with improved data is the the att attaching it to so many other domains and so many new uses. I mean, you know, where where the the, the pandemic. Um, I mean, this was already our stuff was already very live by January. You know, the Irish regulator was investigating Google's use of location, but since then it's been like a decade. You know, there's tracking invention, there's reinventing public spaces, workspaces. You know, and then economic regeneration, the kind of difference that really local data could now make to to you know the, the desperate need to, to regenerate every area of the uk and uh, yeah it's it's uh, it, so i i do think that we, it, it's great that we've done this work thank you ben and alex what would you add um 
I mean, I think everyone summarized it brilliantly and it is about that kind of uh, connection uh, of uh, multiple perspectives, even from across the speakers, right? And what I found really um, uh, kind of surprising but encouraging is that we do seem to be shifting towards these uh, concepts of systems thinking and really understanding that um, uh, there's so much interconnection between disciplines and that the only way that we are going to be able to solve some of the biggest problems that we face is by mobilizing these various um, kind of specialties and resources that we have available to us. I think um, the connection um, that, that Ben also highlighted of the kind of global to the local scale, it's quite difficult to kind of keep in mind but I think across the publication we uh, have examples of very kind of community driven methods like crowd mapping in a location that's very specific and affected by a particular issue to systems level thinking and the SDGs and that kind of more global perspective and um, helping uh, us all to become better equipped with the kind of vocabulary to discuss problems in that way, I think is, is very, very valuable. And uh, I would say that actually in the last couple of months, um, because of the, the kind of uh, reliance of uh, many people uh, on digital networks, I feel like it's been easier to tell that story as well. So um, I know that there are a lot of um, live discussions around contact tracing apps and uh, Ben's right to raise the kind of ethical considerations, but there's also the, the kind of um, uh, peer community networks that have been established due to the power of technology. So uh, it feels like it's an easier story to connect with across all sectors and with, you know, everyone really. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I'm just going to pick out some of the questions from the Q&A box. So this is a question for Caroline from Chris Payne Dwyer. By looking at a people centred energy model, how does this affect moves towards electrification and hydrogen, Caroline? I, I can't answer this for hydrogen, but for electrification, I mean, everything makes it easier if you have only one kind of uh, energy carrier. Um, and this electrification is also super important to increase the efficiency of the system because uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's more efficient than some combustion engine, for example. So the electrification of the entire energy system will leverage large uh, efficiency potentials. And from a user perspective, uh, having everything only electric makes it easier in the long run than to have different kind of uh, energy um, carriers. But of course, I mean, this has to then be again place specific because in some places uh, you will not use certain elect electricity for certain energy services. Um, not everybody will use uh, electricity for heating. Like in France, there's a lot of heating with electricity because they have a lot of nuclear power. Um, in other places, if you do have biomass, you will still continue using biomass for heating or other energy carriers. And in the long run, maybe we will have houses where we hardly have to heat. So yeah, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, that would be my answer. Wonderful, thank you. Houses we can't, don't have to heat, certainly not in Scotland, but perhaps in other parts of the world. Um, and Gwenda Groot has added that she's doing her MBA research project on geospatial data. And she was wondering what you would say, all of you on the panel, that are the key barriers for geospatial data sharing in the UK? And then what are the enabling conditions that could help collaboration and better access to data? So Luca, would you like to start with that, please? Turn on your microphone, please, Luca. Thank you. Just now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, sure. Um, well, uh, I address the collaborative side of things. Uh, in, a, in a more generic terms than the question, but um, he probably is going to answer the question in a way that uh, uh, what we, uh, the way we tend to communicate when we build uh, a, a, a collaborative project is usually via email or PDFs. So, but this is a, a very inefficient way of communicating. It tends to overwhelm uh, um, participants with information. Uh, you might end up missing out on key pieces of information. It's difficult to track documentation uh, across the many revisions. So it is a very inefficient way. In order to create uh, a really collaborative uh, framework, uh, it's good to, to have uh, uh, 
um, an information management system and a stakeholder engagement platforms. And by platforms, I mean a proper technology solution and actually a geospatial information management system. A platform like this could uh, um, potentially uh, would, could uh, could form could have a, a, a communication hub so people could be able to share information openly and via private messaging it would have a, a, a documentation hub so that the documents could be indexed and easily retrievable it would have a, a gis uh, so a geographic information system uh, mapping um, technology embedded in it so that uh, for example, in an infrastructure project, uh, stakeholders can map out all the uh, infrastructure assets and perhaps add the non-geospatial data and link it with geospatial identifier to enrich that layer of information. Uh, and then analysis needs to be within that communication platform so that we can extract information. And finally, I would say, um, a, a ability to socialize decision making so that uh, uh, it is possible to make decision and move on on the project. What I'm trying to say here is that uh, in order to create a, a, a truly collaborative work, a geospatial information management system, geospatial intelligence platform can enable more joined up planning, decision making, more transparent decision making, uh, increased trust across all stakeholders, which is the, probably the main issue on which uh, collaborative project fails and achieve efficiency gain for uh, and benefit all including nature mm. and Ben just to pick up on that idea of trust and perhaps some barriers to collaboration what would you add well I, I suspect you know we, we, we have a lot of uh, personal data legislation and then in in commercial environments there are an awful lot of commercial considerations so I think the barrier is probably people really understanding what new risks or, or exposures there are, you know, when you attach location data to, to other data sets. You know, the uh, work done by the team at Imperial a couple of years ago that demonstrated that you could re-identify individuals from a very, very small number of data points in anonymized data sets. So I think it's, it's probably you know, the, the barriers are sensibly erected barriers for good reason in, in law. What is probably challenging now is, is, you know, where you get caught on those, you know, where the data that you, you may accumulate may, uh, you know, may, may take a, uh, you know, get, get you into a risk area. It's interesting, I, I spoke at a conference in January, PrivSec, and there was a, a trade show with a lot of organizations that do basically data protection services, outsourcing services for businesses. And I talked to them about location data and, and the majority of them that, that said they had an issue with it or that their clients had an issue with it, it was, their, it was tracking employees. So in various different ways, they've been tracking their employees going back years and years and just not really thought about it. And then these people were having to go to their clients and saying, you, you know what, actually all of this data you hold on, on your employees in locations is all personal data, it's all GDPR relevant, possibly relevant to all sorts of other areas of legislation, certainly to your relations with your employees. And I think that's, that's that kind of situation, you know, people have got into places through incremental improvements in technology and they've just said, yeah, okay, I mean, that's great. That works better. We'll have that one as well. And, and, and you know, it, it can, can take you somewhere um, that perhaps that we're never expecting. And I think uh, it's probably understanding those sort of wider impacts you get from connecting a lot of things up. Yeah. And Alex, just to um, pick up some of those ideas about how we can make the sharing of technology equal across society. So how do we make sure it's distributed and not just in certain silos, that it is more equitable? Well, I mean, I think the issue that Ben's highlighting is that a lot of the time, the people who technology ends up affecting, all of us, aren't involved in the design and the development of those systems. And that's where collective intelligence methods, participatory methods, which draw on inputs from people on the ground, from people affected by particular circumstances, from those in, in very um, uh, uh, 
diverse um, kind of socioeconomic settings, they're really important to have uh, uh, as contributors to the discussion. So in our research on AI and collective intelligence, the report that we published earlier this year, we map out a data pipeline and AI life cycle and uh, suggest leverage points at which you might choose to introduce methods that draw on those wider inputs in order to help drive the improvement or that wider conversation about technology. And there's a lot of great initiatives being supported by Ada Lovelace Institute, for example, um, uh, in, in the UK. And I think we are starting to see um, that change in mindset, even amongst uh, industry. So the, the kind of moratoriums that have recently been imposed on facial recognition technology, there's clearly a reaction to um, the, the kind of public opinion uh, when it comes to these technologies. And I think we need to be le leveraging that much more than we currently are. And to be honest, it's probably going to lead to better technology. So it's in our favor to do that. Yeah. And Carolyn, you had mentioned um, the world in 2050, which is fascinating. What is your main takeaway from that? Uh, that scientists like to argue <laughs> <laughs> with each other. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, it took a long time to come um, to common terminology. Um, that was uh, really tough, or even with the, across scientific boundaries, so even within science. And then we, when we brought in policymakers, of course, this uh, brought another level of um, complexity because we had all these great ideas of what had to be done, uh, but then it was not actionable because of the silos on the ground. Um, so I, I saw a comment on the de-siloing, I think, uh, of the world. And I would, uh, I would second that um, because the question is always, what is in your decision capacity, like, in your decision power? If you're only in charge as a policymaker for energy, um, and others are only in charge for agriculture, um, then you have to bring those two people together so that they then harness these synergies for, of certain policies if they plan together. But then, of course, the question is, are they on the same political side and is this uh, in their own interests and so all of that. So, so I, uh, it's always nice to have on your drawing board the perfect world, but then how to operationalize that and how to deal with the existing realities on the ground in but the, in those institutions and also in how, how we have the world, we, how we have split up the world to reduce complexity. I mean, this is the same for academia or, or ministries. It is really hard to bridge the border and especially in addition to get out of your daily work because it is additional work. I mean, everybody, have, it's not like people sit around and are bored, but this is an additional level um, of things that you have to do. But then also in the long term, it will pay off. So it is worth to invest in this additional um, level of uh, complexity, I would say. Yeah. And another Q&A um, question that's come into the Q&A box is about the term integration, which is something everyone's mentioned. Um, and the question of Bijan says, are we moving towards a super system of integrated entities? What would you say, Caroline? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, no. we are rather seeing that, uh, I mean, it, it, in reality, there is the super system, everything is connected anyways, but then you can't handle it, you still have to make it manageable. But it's, I think it's important that people are aware of the interconnections and think about it, because in reality, you can't think about everything all the time anyways. I mean, this is, it's too complex. Mm -hmm. But just to be aware and try to avoid maybe the most obvious um, trade-offs uh, will already help. Um, and, and yeah, I think the, the first step is just to be aware and then the next step you can plan it. But the reality is, yeah, everything is connected. It's already there. It's not new. Yeah. And Ben, perhaps you could pick up this next question, which is about using AI tools and it being a wild west. Um, what do you believe are the prospects for general AI? What and when? Uh, I, 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 I can't speak to general AI because, you know, uh, neither can anyone else, um, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, all sorts of people who know uh, the working bionic years that disagree violently um, about when it may be or, or, or what it might be or anything else. And I must say that I'm, I'm very interested in in spatial AI. You know, what, what kind of what kind of new abilities are created if you if you develop machine learning um, with spatial data? 
and I've, I've asked a, a, a number of senior research and, and you know what what sort of ethical issues what new power relations could be created and, and I must say I've asked a few um, senior uh, AI researchers that and each one of them has said that's a really interesting question and that's that that's it so far so I mean I, I, <laughs> I think this is a I, I think we will we will see sort of spatial AI things very soon and as far as I know, there is there is very little sort of consensus or, or big public discussion about it. I think it's a really interesting area, but I, I find it extremely hard to 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 predict. Um, I do think you know generally the we are going to see a great deal more of the surveillance capitalism model, um, sort of back a bit to the last question as well. But that sort of accumulation of data, and you know we 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 will see the very big companies developing uh, AI now with spatial data added to the, all the other data reserves they had so so i imagine you know we'll still need to look to to the really big digital majors um to see what's coming out of there watch this space well we've only got a couple of minutes left so if anyone has any other burning questions please add them in now and um, alex would you like to pick up that idea of integration and perhaps some of the ethical questions that have arisen over the the, the course of the webinar i mean what's your opinion of of ai and geospatial data um, sure. Uh, I, I guess I, I think the focus is slightly off. I mean, I'm, I'm really intellectually interested in pushing our technological abilities, but shouldn't we be developing these technologies to help us become better at managing the situations that we can't cope with? I think we need to be reframing some of the narratives that we have around AI. A lot of it is either that it's going to save us and we won't have to do anything or it's going to replace us and again we won't have to do anything and I'm much more interested in how we can work with AI and how it can help us to extend some beyond some of our cognitive lim limitations. So I referenced uh, kind of uh, the modeling capabilities. And what's really useful about simulations and models that are based on, for example, multi-agent systems or swarm intelligence is that they help us to visualize and, and kind of extend our uh, mental machinery and develop a kind of shared space where we can discuss and change parameters together and make decisions in a way that is much more complex than we would otherwise be able to do either individually or collectively. I think that opportunity space is incredibly exciting. And of course, geospatial data will feed into making those models as accurate as possible. There'll only ever be a representation of the world, but as a tool, it's, it opens up a great amount of potential. And that's what I'm interested in. So so let's be thinking about how AI can help us be better as a society. And that's a lovely point to finish on. Unfortunately, we're out of time and a few more questions have come in. So please feel free to get in touch with the speakers um, and we will pass on uh, any other questions over email as well. So just remains for me to thank each of our speakers, Luca Bodello, Caroline Zim, Ben Hawes and Alex Berdich. Skaya, excuse me, I did try to pronounce your name well there. Okay. Um, and I hope everyone has enjoyed this webinar. I have certainly been fascinated by all the points that have been raised. Um, and please remember to register for the next one in the series. It's on the 28th of July and it's at 11 o'clock, same as today. And it's called the Era of Geodata Economy. And you can also obviously continue the conversation on Twitter and LinkedIn using the power of place hashtag.